the session is about uh, youth peace building and climate to share with you the stories of some inspiring young leaders on uh, and their journeys in the field. And uh, I'll be joined today with some really inspiring uh, leaders, starting with uh, our youngest uh, participants, uh, speaker, and probably the youngest participant in the conference, Ms. Jato Sonita, who is uh, named the leader of the forest children, and they call her the forest girl. She's joining us from Cameroon, who is a talented 15 years old singer and who comes from the Donga Mantung division in the Northwest region of Cameroon. And she found that she's the leader of the Forest Children, a group of young people due to the socio-political crisis that led to war and disruption of uh, destructions of school. They sought refuge in the forests and started singing and dancing uh, to protest and to also showcase uh, their voices about uh, peace and security and climate. And she reached uh, her songs reached over two million viewers in social media and being uh, supported by very famous singers uh, such as Beyonce. It's really a pleasure to have you with us, uh, Jato. Thanks you for uh, joining us. Our uh, second speaker is uh, Miss Liluni Tilikiratne from Sri Lanka, and she's a researcher and activist on peace building and uh, climate change. Uh, she is a Chevening uh, scholar who did uh, her studies in the University College of London and uh, about both local and international institutions and conflict research. So uh, she's also pursuing her activism in the field uh, about conflict and also youth engagement. And she educates young inspire, uh, aspiring policymakers across the country in Sri Lanka on the need to mainstream climate resilience uh, into development policy. So uh, Niluni also, uh, she are supporting grassroots organizations in you know, project design and implementation related to peace. So thank you for joining us. Uh, our third speaker, and you can see we have people from all around the world today, uh, is Kasha Sekunas Labner from uh, Canada, who is the director of 1.5 degree of peace. Uh, that's a very famous movie that you may have came across. She's a 24 years old founder of the Global Sunrise project and the director and screenwriter of the documentary Sunrise Storyteller, which is a multi-award winning documentary. And it was first uh, yeah, showcased in uh, 2017 and the film has been screened in over 61 film festivals and winning 31 awards so far, which is the uh, multiple awards. And the documentary is about peace building climate and youth situation and uh, Kasha will be sharing her, her experience with us today. Thank you for joining us. And our final speaker is uh, Ms. Tordis, uh, who is a conflict sensitivity advisor with AIDS Gates organization in Iraq. So she's been working in the conflict uh, and peace building area in multiple countries. Uh, and now she is uh, been in Sudan, Namibia, Australia and Indonesia. Now she's working on uh, positive peace in Iraq and researching how we can develop standards uh, and indicators to measure it in Iraq with a youth NGO. So great uh, to be here with you all. And uh, so with that, uh, we'll be having an interactive format. And uh, since, you know, we have all uh, young leaders who have been involved for the past years in youth uh, and peace and climate, and today the session is about peace and climate. So uh, I would love to start the conversation asking you all to describe to us a moment that make you, made you see the connection between peace and climate uh, in your context. So uh, this is a first question for all the speakers. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, uh, Neloni, do you wanna go first? Sure. Thank you very much, Saad, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So, hi everyone, I'm Nelini from Sri Lanka. I'm going to share a moment which really convinced me of the need to get into this space of climate and peace. So there are two districts in Northern Sri Lanka which are adjacent to each other. One district has a decently flourishing river, while the other district is drying up rapidly due to climate change. So the government has introduced a project um, where they're trying to dive, they were trying to divert water from this one district to the district without a river. And, and um, interestingly, the locals refused to share their water. 
And we were all surprised, but again, we were not too surprised given the history of Sri Lankan conflicts. So we saw how there was a politicization of resources where local and district level politicians stepped in and they divided the people of these two districts based on group identity and convinced the people that the water was not to be shared. Um, and they did so to appear as you know heroes in their constituencies. So many of us recognize that climate change has actually triggered identity politics and intergroup conflicts. And this is a clear cut example of how climate change leads to resource competition and you know, triggers the pre-existing um, group animosities, which could really lead into climate conflict. So it highlighted the need for Sri Lankan peace builders to look deeper into the consequences of climate change, because we had not thought about this aspect before. And so personally, this was a revelation on the connection between climate and peace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's so powerful, Neroni. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, seeing how it affects local communities uh yeah indeed uh, has a role uh jato do you want to reflect next since we're speaking on local communities hello everyone my name is jato sonita the forest girl from the forest children band and like mr sad said i'm from the northwest region of cameroon which has been characterized by war for the past years so during this period in our community, there was a lot of gunshots, insecurity, and so the only place we could find refuge in was the forest. And while in the forest, the forest provided us with security, it provided us with shelter. And that was where I saw the relation between climate, climate and peace. While in the forest, the forest protected us, it gave us security. And also the forest is the foundation of our ecosystem. That is the foundation of what helps us fight against climate change. We all have this because from where I come from, we trust our forest so much. We have, we rely on our forest for everything, for food, for medication. And while in the forest, the forest helped us even with dresses, as you can see, I'm mostly dressed in leaves because that was what was available for us in the forest. The forest helped bring together so many people during this crisis because that was where we found refuge. It brought us together, it made us united. And there are this, there's, there's this tree we normally call the umbrella tree. This is where our parents come and sit to discuss on issues that could help solve our problems in our, in, in our community. Conflicts, marital issues, this is where they come and sit to solve this problem. And I found out that the forest is not only important to protect our environment, but it also promotes peace. And in our journey to, pro to promote um, peace, promotion of climate change, um, planting of trees, we also indirectly promote peace in our community. So to me, the forest has a lot to do with peace and climate. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing. That's really inspiring. And uh, we, we can feel that, you know, you living there in the forest and talking about it like it's a member of the family and in reality it is a member of our family human and environmental family and you know how climate and forest is related and uh, really connected to peace thanks for sharing uh, maybe kasha do you want to reflect next sure um thank you so much for having me here today um I would say that my roots in activism had been planted in movements for peace and disarmament since I was a teenager growing up in Canada. And, um, you know, when I realized that storytelling was something that I was passionate about, um, it became inseparable from my activism. Um, and as I was coming to take on my newest project, I realized I had to focus on what was most critical to myself and my generation and the climate crisis was impossible to turn away from. Um, I can say that I've had the privilege of not living on the front lines of the climate crisis, but I've witnessed as friends that I've made and allies that I've made around the world have impact have been impacted by you know fires, floods, uh, the impacts uh, on you know food and agri agricultural supply, migration, firsthand, and I've learned about the deep connection between militaristic occupation, weapons testing, extraction, and our climate crisis. And militaries have a huge um, ecological footprint that is not being held to account. 
um, responsible for, you know, violating people's lands, waters, um, and harming, you know, primarily BIPOC communities. Um, and so, you know, learning this from my friends and hearing the stories of young people who are living at the forefront of these issues, um, I realized that, you know, the climate, like the climate movement and the peace movement, we're addressing these interconnections, but in silos, not building coal coalitions and having these conversations together and sitting down, you know, um, and I realized that storytelling could be a tool to help people, you know, build those connections um, and connect emotionally to the people who are living um, at the nexus of these issues so that we can all, you know, join in solidarity together. So, um, stories have really had that power in my life. Amazing, amazing. And yeah, uh, stories are so powerful. And you also have been sharing the stories in your documentary as well. We'll hear about this in a second. So thanks for sharing. Finally, Thordis. Um, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Thordis. Um, I'm a conflict sensitivity advisor for AidGate organization. And uh, so my story is that I moved to Iraq over a year ago, and I moved into a nice little house in, in Erbil. Um, and my house, like many other houses in my neighborhood, uh, had a water tank on the roof. And every week you had to make sure that you pump enough water from the underground water network onto the roof on top so that you could take a shower. Um, and in the summer, it happened often that there was not enough water available to switch on the pump. And um, I would wake up early in the morning when I heard that my neighbors had switched on their pump and quickly ran downstairs to switch on my own to make sure that they weren't taking the water from my own tank. Um, and I realized that if I was going to, going to be in friendly competition with the three really lovely Assyrian neighbors that I had, the three ladies living next door, um, who cooked biryani for me every Saturday and brought it over <laughs> in their own pot, if I was in competition with them over the water in a modern city such as Erbil, then what would it look like in the rest of the country, such as in Basra or in Saladin, further south where people were actually struggling with water consumption and were reliant on agriculture and moving to the big cities because they were running out of water. Um, so yeah, so that's my personal story of how I first came into contact of climate change and conflict. Amazing, amazing. Thanks for sharing Tordis. And indeed, you know, water and all those resources are a vital, vital role that can really create conflicts or reduce and combat conflicts. Uh, and we'll hear more, more stories from you all. Uh, Niloni, I want to get back to you and uh, uh, hear some thoughts. Uh, would love to uh, hear more about your experience and the role that data and research plays in uh, connecting climate and peace work. So, uh, yeah, to you the floor. Thank you, Sad. I mean, I'm already so inspired by those sessions. It's incredible. Um, what a privilege to be here. So, yes, there's my slide on. Yeah. So, um, as I said, I'm Niloni and um, I've been working actually on climate um, research, which is my kind of primary, um, while I do my activism, I'm also a researcher. So I would say I've been um, in activism for about 12 years, uh, working with young people in peace building by day and by night, <laughs> mostly a, a researcher. And um, just as Keisha said, there's such a disconnect between peace builders and the climate movement and you know, I've kind of come into the middle ground. Like you've come, like Keisha's come with storytelling. I've come in with research. So I mean, I'm, I'll just you know share from there. So um, as I mentioned before, I've been actually researching on environmental peace building and um, climate change for a while. Um, my inspiration actually comes from growing up in South Asia, which has seen waves upon waves of communal and political violence over the last few decades, especially my own country, Sri Lanka. Um, so, you know, as you can see in the map, we are also in a region considered highly vulnerable to climate change. The map actually, actually shows the environmental conflicts that were tracked in 2018 globally. Um, so anyway, despite the global acknowledgement of the nexus of conflict, um, climate, peace and security, um, Asian academics, 
um, especially Sri Lankans, have not really looked into the dimension of addressing the concerns of peace building in the face of climate change. So if you can go to the next slide, sir. Yeah, so these are just, um, you know, this, this slide just goes to show how many conflicts are recorded, but recorded conflicts doesn't mean these conflicts are researched. So when I took a shot at researching on the same myself, especially on the Sri Lankan case, um, I was the least surprised by the lack of relevant data. Sri Lanka has excellent data on climate change and forecasting weather patterns, but nothing substantial on conflict analysis. And I relied on study, studies mostly from the African continent um, to understand the implications of climate change on security in an Asian context. Thankfully, there have been amazing um, research done on many countries in the African continent, especially, which have already experienced climate change. Um, but anyway, I had a long struggle of trying to contextualize all of this um, into Sri Lankan context. And my research showed, you know, unsurprisingly, that Sri Lanka and many other Asian countries are quite seriously vulnerable to climate conflict. So, you know, the conflicts that come about due to climate change. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so dry zones in Sri Lanka, so, I mean, if I were to paint a picture, um, you know, to summarize what's going to happen, you know, from the Sri Lankan point of view, right, just as a case study. So as you can see on the left, uh, Sri, the, the island of Sri Lanka, the yellow patch is the dry zone and the blue patch is the wet zone. So it says that, you know, with, with climate change, the dry zone will get drier and the wet zone will get wetter. So what's going to happen is as the dry zone gets drier, it's going to lead to intense droughts, um, which will lead to competition for water and food. And Sri Lanka is larger in agrarian economy. So we will see farmers competing over limited water resources, just as Thordis did, uh, but on a much larger, <laughs> grander, chaotic scale. And uh, they will be competing for limited fertile land. And wet zones will also get wetter. We are going to see an increase in floods, increasing displacement, and uh, the risk of conflict between communities due to loss of livelihoods and internal migration. And all of this, while, um, as you can see on the other map, sea levels are set to rise. And we are going to see many of our key cities in the coastal areas, um, you know, people in those key cities having to displace, be displaced as well. So uh, my research so shows that as communities start competing for resources, past histories of conflicts and past animosities will also get triggered, especially, you know, given Sri Lanka's history of political and ethnic and uh, political ethnic and even religious contestation. Um, structural violence is also a key factor in terms of the role of the state. And we know that um, governments, especially in developing nations or authoritarian nations, are prone to exercising structural violence and exclusion um, of certain communities from accessing scarce resources. So um, climate change is often called a threat multiplier with the potential to catalyze the reoccurrence of these tensions. So this is going to <laughs> sound a bit ironic, um, but this is from a purely academic point of view uh, to share that um, I did a bit of research on predicting climate conflict in Sri Lanka, and I'm, I'm not happy to say, but again, I'm happy to say <laughs> that my research findings were backed by the multiple cases of tensions, including the example I previously shared about the water scarcity and the the, the inability of two districts um, of this, you know, for them to share their own water. I mean, it kind of validated the studies that I did using African and European frameworks. It, you know, it justified the, the findings. So um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, then it comes to the question of how we're going to use this knowledge to improve the effectivity of peace building. So in the nexus of climate peace and security, local peace builders will have to use climate data and conflict vulnerability data to identify areas vulnerable to climate change um, and then work backwards. So for example, um, if we can go to the next slide, right? So, um, for example, you know, in the case of uh, environmental peace building, we're going to see if we can use data to identify uh, local areas 
where local peace builders can get onto the ground and you know work with these communities, have conversations with these communities, and raise awareness on the possibilities of resource competition, and convince these communities to always choose nonviolent conflict resolution when it you know when, ten when tensions do rise. And um, also, we want to be building positive peace as well. Um, so local peace builders will have to work backwards before conflict does come about. And we can also make communities more used to sharing resources. And of course, this approach will be different in countries that are already struggling with climate conflict. So, I mean, I'm talking about the Sri Lankan context where we predict climate conflict and we you know, work backwards, which is, um, you know, in many Asian cases as well, but especially in, say, for example, the African continent where the, climate, the conflicts are very much um, in process and they're taking place, you know, we can still use research and data um, to tackle um, factors that are prolonging the conflict, you know, such as income grievances or um, lack of access to resources. Uh, yeah, if you can go to the next slide, please. Right, so, you know, this also means peace builders must diligently engage with policymakers who must mainstream resilience and readiness to climate conflicts in policy. So, you know, if I give an example again from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's national policy on climate change can include climate conflict prediction. And um, Sri Lanka's national reconciliation policy can talk about the need to mitigate future climate conflict and these things can, you know, must happen through government institutions. Other policy areas such as education policy and health policy will also have to you know, ensure equitable resource allocation to communities that are vulnerable to climate change. If we are to avoid conflicts um, you know, when changing weather patterns happen and people start scurrying around. So I myself have been doing you know, these, these things to the best of my ability and I've uh, been engaged in what is called environmental peace building. And I've been working with young peace builders, you know, as, as Saad mentioned before as well, I've been working with young peace builders um, in Sri Lanka and abroad, including some Asian countries, to first introduce them to the concept of environmental peace building and then help them design projects to mitigate climate conflicts in vulnerable areas. I also work with young policymakers from diverse thematic areas. You know, we talk about how we can design policy that doesn't just address environmental consequences of climate change, but also looks at social conflicts. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot more research needed um, and a lot of data needs to be mined um, to look at how past climate, uh, past conflicts can be understood and predict future ones. So I myself had to, you know, bring in a lot of different international data sets to make predictions for my own country, which is not the most accurate way of doing things, but, yeah, regardless, getting this data to the hands of young people on the ground is absolutely necessary if to, you know, proactively address the ne nexus of climate peace and security. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Amazing. Thank you, Niluni. And we always say we, we cannot fight something that we don't know. And data and research are crucial to getting uh, more spotlight and uh, showing how serious the, the issue is. And that's what you've been doing in Sri Lanka with, with all the work that you showed. And thank you for sharing. Uh, moving on, I'll also call on the floor, Kasha, to share with us also from your journey, what roles do you see for young people to use media such as films, documentaries, in addressing the peace and conflict and the climate cause? Absolutely. So um, coming from a background as a storyteller, um, I've realized what a critical role media can play in either numbing us into doing nothing or empowering us to take the lead in searching for sustainable solutions. And when we think about climate change and conflict, I think we really need to rethink the narratives that we're telling currently or that we see perpetuated in mainstream media. Um, especially their ability to shape our belief systems about what's possible um, for these issues. And I think we have to look at, you know, what stories are really being elevated and brought to the forefront and which stories are getting lost in the fray, um, in the sensationalized headlines and the, 
the stereotypical kind of narratives. Um, and it's really important to also examine who is telling the stories about these issues. I think the role that youth have is in reclaiming our own narratives through storytelling so that we can accurately depict the ways that these issues are impacting us and our communities personally. Um, when the mainstream media or policymakers try to place us into these neat boxes or silos, um, we can show them through media that our world is more nuanced than that. And so are the solutions that we need to address the systemic injustices that are facing our world. And from my, my experience personally as a storyteller, I know that, you know, stories are one of the most powerful tools to bridge divides, raise awareness, and catalyze positive change because stories have the unique ability to build empathy and open minds, and we can use it to illustrate our vision for a world that is possible if we take action. We have to look at the world that we want, and sometimes idealism can be used or carried with shame, or, you know, the word can be placed on us with shame because, you know, we're so attached to the way things are, but we've proved, you know, I think even just in rooms like these or conferences like these, that there are people who are creatively addressing these issues at a grassroots level, and they have expertise and knowledge to share with policymakers um, that is transformative, and we need that to elevate those kinds of stories. Um, and talking about emotional connection, I think people rarely take action without feeling that emotional connection to a cause, and that's why media is necessary. We can talk about data, and I think using data to contextualize, like using stories to contextualize that kind of data is so important. You know, showing the, the real life impact of these issues, um, combining the two, you know, storytelling and data have such a power when used together. Um, and so I think that if we can elevate stories, people can be, sorry, can be moved beyond feeling paralyzed. Um, and they can be given a guide into, you know, here's a way that you can take steps forward together. Um, with my work, 1.5 Degrees of Peace, um, the film is still in production. It's a character-driven feature documentary following the unfolding stories of young people in regions that are most hard hit by the impacts of these intersecting threats. Um, and the film documents their journey to you know, find solutions, building bridges between disarmament, peace building, and environmental justice. Um, and these are complicated issues, but uh, 1.5 Degrees of Peace is not a doom and gloom film. Uh, to me, creating balanced narratives is key. So showing the challenges of young leaders in achieving environmental justice, uh, demilitarization, and confronting systemic violence is key but we also need to highlight the joy and community that exists within these movements to inspire other people to join us in our efforts so that they see that there is, you know, there is hope through taking action and there is hope through sustained community. And not to say hope with, you know, just as a band-aid, but hope in a way that, you know, we can be sustained to continue taking action because it is a long-term goal um, and it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of different approaches. Um, so storytelling has been my approach. Um, and with that, I would love to share the trailer for the film. Um, so I will share my screen and I hope you enjoy. Peace and climate justice are more connected than we realize. I'm Kasia Sequoia Slavner. I'm a Gen Z documentary filmmaker and a peace and climate activist from Toronto, Canada. I've been feeling so much anxiety about climate change. Uncertain, frustrated, people are making decisions for our generation without taking our future realities into consideration. Code Red for Humanity, released today by the United Nations, paints a grim picture for our future unless we take action now. I'm on a mission to show just how closely connected peace and climate justice are. Wars, a lot of militarization, are taking away 
budgets, but are also putting a lot of carbon emissions in the air. Through stories of youth making positive change. Through the people and the planet on the planet. Those who are already exposed to violence and war are those who are also most vulnerable to the extreme weather events. Movements of all kinds are pretty much single issue. They're siloed. Climate change and nuclear weapons, we have to deal with them together. And stop both clocks ticking towards our extinction. How can we turn our anxiety about these existential threats into bold action that holds leaders accountable? How can we find hope? The climate crisis isn't just about carbon dioxide emissions, it's about people. What if people were as well trained in waging peace as soldiers are in waging war? We need a peace movement to accommodate everyone because everyone's life is at stake. A community led by the most marginalized sectors of society fueled by this love for peace. A love for the planet. Take small steps, baby steps, the ripple effect will be very dramatic. Each one of us is powerful beyond measure. It's my hope that these stories of courageous action ease our personal and collective anxiety, igniting us to stand together and catalyzing a unified intergenerational peace movement for the survival of our planet and all living beings. Unless we do something, we're in deep shit. Amazing, amazing. Thank you very much, Kasha, for sharing and uh, yeah, for really for those of you who are interested, of course, you can share the link of the, the, the trailer and also more details. And storytelling is a must, right? A lot of people are doing stuff in the ground. But those are the, the stories that need to be amplified. And uh, speaking of, you know, uh, ground and local uh, work, we were here with uh, Tordis as well, who's been engaged in youth organizations and NGOs. So uh, Tordis, based on your experience, what role do youth organizations play at the intersection of climate and peace? And what are some examples of positive peace connected to climate action uh, in your context? Um, thanks, Sad, and thanks, Kasha, for showing that. I forgot for a minute that I was in a conference. <laughs> I'll have to watch your film when it comes out. <laughs> I was really moved by it. Um, so I'd like to briefly start with introducing AidGate organization. Um, Sad, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. So um, AGO or AIDGATE organization is an Iraqi national NGO, which was established by a group of young Iraqi volunteers in 2014 in Saladin Governorate in central Iraq um, to work mainly on the emergency, um, uh, the humanitarian aid emergency that resulted from the Islamic State um, in Iraq and the Levant coming into the country. Uh, and it's evolved into a formally registered NGO in, who works in all of Iraq in the fields of food security and livelihoods, climate change, social cohesion, protection, and good governance. Um, so AGO has many projects pertaining to climate change and so social cohesion, which include educating school children on climate change and the environment uh, by providing climate smart, smart agriculture training to youth as well as teaching youth about climate change as part of livelihood skills development and social cohesion, uh, which is a project uh, empowering youth to create advocacy groups across Iraq and to find a voice themselves to advocate for their own issues and not for NGOs to come in and dictate, oh, we see this is an issue, please advocate for it. Uh, so that's currently ongoing, ongoing in Accra as well as Tel Afar district. So what is climate change in Iraq? Exactly, thanks, Sad. 
So um, AGEO has already observed uh, ongoing conflict and the potential for future conflict in Iraq uh, through our own studies, but as well as desk reviews. Uh, youth in Iraq make up the largest share of the population pyramid, but are facing is issues such as insufficient work opportunities, which can be seen through high unemployment rates, um, insufficient education and vocational training, as well as not being empowered enough to take part in public life and advocate for their own needs. Um, so how is Iraq vulnerable to climate change? Um, so Iraq has a high reliance on fossil fuel, um, is impacted by water scarcity, as well as desertification. And I'm going to throw at you some of these, this data, which um, I can't do a presentation without data. Uh, so sorry about that, but um, the Children's Climate Risk Index ranks Iraq as 61st out of 163 countries and 42nd among the most water stressed countries in the world. Iraq is ranked the fifth most vulnerable country to climate change. And Iraq is one of the largest oil producers, producers in the world, um, just behind Russia, I believe. So while only 1% of the workforce in Iraq is employed in the oil sector, 40% of all jobs are in the public sector, and therefore a worsening Iraqi economy due to less demand in oil exports from Iraq globally will cause a, uh, will cause a loss in jobs. Then we have 25% of Iraqi population, which is reliant on agriculture, such as wheat, barley, dates, and livestock which are integral to all farms. And a decreased rainfall and desertification have contributed to loss of arable land and income. And then finally, Iraq is running out of water. So by 2035, the gap in water supply is estimated to reach 11 billion cubic tons, um, according to the latest World Bank report, which represents more than 15% of total water demand. Um, so this is what we're already all experiencing in Erbil and in other parts of the country, um, as sometimes we have to go to work with greasy hair in the mornings and we can't shower. <laughs> so um, peace and conflict in Iraq, that's uh, the next slide. So um, Iraq has been torn apart. Yes, thank you. So Iraq has been torn apart by conflict for many decades. It's the seventh least peaceful country in the world, um, according to the Global Peace Index by the Institute for Economics and Peace in Sydney. Uh, there's a large gap in literature, however, concerning interstate conflict in Iraq, its causes, and most importantly, an action plan on how to actually bring peace to the country. So AGO researches peace and conflict dynamics on a regular basis as well as AGO's impact on the conflict um, in our different projects that we have across the country. And uh, we believe that there's a lot of capacities for peace and happiness in Iraq, which still need to be explored and invested in further. So to conclude on the first question that Saad asked, um, Iraq is struggling with effects of climate change as well as old conflict issues already. And AGO has found that the youth across Iraq are already extremely outspoken and motivated to change the current situation and advocate for more peace and a better environment. Um, but they're simply missing their opportunity to be heard. And local organizations are often better placed than international actors as they know the context, they know their own communities and they can enable the communities to actually advocate for change. So concerning the second part of your question, um, Sad, if you could go to the next slide, please. <laughs> so yeah, so I'd like to present a story from Iraq on peace and climate change. Um, so Ayash couldn't be with us here today. Um, he's not very good at English, but I will be showing you his story, telling you his story for him. So Ayash Tahir Ismail is 18 years old. He's from Habib al Abdullah village in Mansouria district in Diyala governorate of Iraq. He's the eldest son in a family of eight and is the sole breadwinner for his family. Um, Ayash left his studies in 2014 in order to support his family financially when the Islamic State came to his village. 
and he currently works in the vegetable market. Ayash joined an AGO program teaching young people how to conduct climate smart agriculture and learned how to restore his family's neglected orchard. So Diala has a mixture of cultures and backgrounds. Um, there are Sunni and Shia Muslims, there's Christians, Kurds, and Turkmen who are all living together. Um, the agriculture course enabled all of these different groups to come together and interact peacefully. And Ayash is actually still in contact with the other youth from this course, and they update each other regularly on their lives. So um, as you can see on the slide, this is Ayash. Um, and he says that my life has not been easy, but I have learned to be strong and resilient. I had to leave my studies and work su to support my family after we were affected by the events of 2014. Uh, so by this, he means the Islamic State coming to his village. Um, I used to work every day for daily wages to support my life, but I felt that I needed to do something more meaningful with my life. I spent wonderful days during the training, learning about the different types of plants, how to plant them, and how to take care of them. I learned about the importance of trees and the positive effects that they have on the environment, such as absorbing carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. After graduating from the training course, Ayash used his newfound experience to restore his family's orchard. The vegetables flourished and the orchard became a model for his village and a way of life for Ayash and his family. The fresh air of the orchard comforted Ayash's father, where he now spends all of his days sitting in the orchard and contemplating life. Ayash hopes that through his orchard, agriculture will be revived again in the region and restored to what it was before the conflict, helping combat desertification, which is already increasing day by day. So finally, Ayash states, I am proud to have made a positive impact on my community and the environment. I will continue to plant more trees and I encourage others to do the same. Thank you. Amazing, that's really inspiring. And uh, yeah, kudos to Ayash and to the Iraq team for, you know, changing and uh, making sure those people who are there in the ground and who are like the leaders and the, the, the ones saving the society and environments are empowered and supported so that they can, you know, improve themselves and take better action. And uh, as you showed, uh, you know, it's really important to realize how local actors are valuable to really making change and restoring peace and making sure climate and environment is taken care of. So they should be part of the discussion and uh, heavily involved. And speaking of local actors, uh, we have with us one of the local uh, climate and peace leaders from Cameroon, uh, Jato. Back to you again. We would love to hear from your experience. What impact can music and art have on young people's lives and on peace and climate? So uh, Jato, to you the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Sad. Um, I would like to first of all start by my ex start by talking about my experience in the forest. Like I said, I come from one of the north from one of the English speaking regions of Cameroon, the northwest region of Cameroon, in Central Africa, which has been characterized by war for the past seven years now. And during this period, we had nowhere to go. We were so traumatized, and the only place we could find refuge in was the forest. Please, the next slide, please. So as you can see in the, in the picture, we have burning of houses. There was the destruction of so many buildings, so many properties, even loss of lives, lives of our family members and friends. Please, next slide, sir. Okay, a school that was burnt during this crisis. You could see how people left their area, people relocated from their area. Next slide, please, sir. Sorry. Just be fast and brief. Here we had burning of a hospital, many other villages, people's houses, make people. Next slide, please. As you can see, during this period, most of us ran to the forest, like hundreds of thousands of people started living in the forest. And while in the forest, we had to do so many things that could help us calm ourselves down and make us forget about the trauma and everything that had to stress us up. Next slide, please. 
on this picture, you're going to see myself and some children. These were the children. We were together in the forest together. And during this period, we just had to do something that will keep us entertained to get forget about the gunshots and the lives that has been lost. Some of the children lost their parents even in the war. We even lost some of our friends, our brothers and sisters. So during this period, we had to come together and see what we could do together to keep ourselves entertained. We engaged in music, dancing, comedy, and singing. In this slide, you can see that we have just leaves on our body because while in the forest, we had no resources, we had limited resources. All we could get in the forest were the leaves and there was no way for us to go back into, this, into the town center to get something for us to wear because we we're so scared of being killed. We had to wear the leaves and that was where we got our, that's where we got our life from. That's where we began. And we decided to call ourselves a forest children band. And that's how the band originated. Please next slide, sir. Next please, this is the same slide. Okay, here you can see us planting trees because while in the forest we discovered that the forest was our new home, like we needed to protect our forest. That was the place that gave us security, it gave us medication, it gave us food, it gave us shelter. So we had to protect it and by so doing, we had to plant more trees to be able to conserve that home that we had. That's why we see we're celebrating the, the, for, the um, International Day of Forest and this is something we have put in our minds that we are going to do every single year because the forest is a very big gift to us. Thank you very much. Next slide. You can see we were planting some more trees in the forest to be able to have more than what we have because we have almost all the leaves every day in the forest. We do have a of banana leaves almost all the time and replanting them is the only way to be able to have more of them all the time. Next, please. Here you could see me on a platform, a very big stage, and you see the Legion of Peace here. As we, we decided to protect our environment, the forest, we decided to promote peace and our environment. The Legion of Peace talks about the protection of our environment. It talks about the protection of the forest, conserving the forest. And here you could see that from the forest, we got a name that was able to make the world hear our voice. It gave us a voice both in our community and even in the world. This was an invitation that we had in one of our biggest shows that we have ever performed in here in Cameroon. And that was where we had the chance to even explore more than what we had in us. That's where we discovered so many other talents in us. Next, please. Here, this is Chato Sunita, the face of the Forest Children Band. This was what we discovered after our experience in the forest. We decided to bring ourselves back to the forest to promote what made us who we are because the forest is what gave us our identity. The forest is what gave us the visibility in our community and even gave us a voice that is being heard by the world. Now, going back to the question, sad, Mr. Sad, sorry. You said the relation, the, how climate change and peace have influenced our generation. This is a very big, music first of all, is a very important way to communicate information. Please, the next slide, let me, I would like to use. So from this, you can see that music has helped us communicate meaningful information to the world and this in music can be used as a method of learning it is a means of communicating useful and meaningful information arts and music is one of the most used instruments in the world today because for entertainment we use music and art for car for um, the um, relaxation we use music and art music is also a method of Music is also a method of, like, let's, how can I put it? Uh, it relieves you of stress, a means of employment. From my experience, I was now, like, employed to myself. It helped reduce the level of crime wave because most of us were occupied with, with, with doing music and some activities that helped restrict us from doing some kind of things that 
will make us get into trouble. And a lot of young people presently who have been looking up to musicians and listening to meaningful information that they pass through music have been influenced a lot. And some of them even indulge in taking music as a career of their own. It has reduced the level of crime, drug abuse, and even juvenile delinquency in the community, as I can say. Because when you're entertained, you are like, you are occupied at that moment. So it keeps you occupied all the time. We in the forest, as an example, we were always occupied with music and all the other arts activities we had. There are children who play the drum, children who dance, and children who do many different activities. To me, music is a way to link up peace, climate, and even bring together all sorts of arts together. Thank you very much, sir. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Jato, really for your inspiring uh, reflections and story. And uh, all the best to you and to the forest children. Say hi to them uh, from my side. And, you know, witnessing the power of young people uh, speaking up and transmitting their voice to the world. And you're doing a great job in Cameroon. So thank you for sharing and inspiring us with your story. Uh, of course, uh, so many inspiring stories, amazing young leaders. And uh, before maybe opening the floor to uh, interactions and uh, questions and answers, we would love to ask each of you uh, one final reflection. Uh, uh, as young actors uh, and you've been involved and doing uh, work, what are the biggest challenges and uh, recommendation uh, you have for supporting youth climate and peace uh, advocacy? So maybe one challenge and one uh, recommendation for us to you know, for the world to, to hear and support youth climate and peace advocacy. So, uh, yeah, who wants to go first? I Kasa? guess I can, I can jump in. Um, I would say in both, you know, the non-profit space and in the film, you know, industry or creative spaces, the biggest challenge has been um, securing funding for our projects. And I think if you talk to a lot of young people in advocacy, they'll they'll say the same thing that uh, sustained funding and spending all your time writing grants, seeking out little bits here and there is one of the greatest barriers to uh, sustaining your work uh, in the long term and also creating being able to create and implement implement sustainable long-term solutions. We need access to multi-year funding. It shouldn't have to be, you know, scrounging for scraps where we can. Um, it's one of the barriers that's keeping us from continuing our work. And it's also one of those uh, challenges that leads to a lot of burnout in, in people in the field. And if we want people to stay engaged in this work and to, to feel rewarded, we need to be able to sustain ourselves in our communities. Um, so it sounds, you know, Productive sometimes, but funding can be one of those make or break challenges. Um, so yeah, access, like helping young people find where to access and also, you know, opening up more pathways for, for funding for those kind of projects is necessary. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And I can relate to that. Thanks, Yukasha, for, for, for sharing. Uh, Tortis, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so for us, I think... Um, it, what, what I'd really like to say is that we have to work now on more peaceful communities um, in order to mitigate climate change conflicts in the future. Um, so climate change programming without like the peace programming side um, is not sustainable at all. And it's unfortunately, peace programming is something that not many actors are doing. Um, and it's not very interesting to donors to fund peace. Um, so... Um, that's something that I'd like to highlight. Um, and then the biggest challenge, but also opportunity for change is that civil society organizations and NGOs directly implement, implementing small scale projects with a group of people on peace and climate change, um, in our opinion, has an immense impact. Uh, however, we need complementary advocacy to happen more on a higher level uh, to change laws and policies of a country to include young people in decision making. Um, as well as adapt climate change regulations um, and listening to communities' needs. Um, I'd also like to say that links between climate change and conflict or displacement should be evidence-based and not assumed. So 
correlation is not causality. Um, therefore, careful analysis must be done, you know, just because people are moving from agricultural areas into the cities might not be related to climate change at all, but might be related to young people seeking out new job opportunities that are more interesting to them. So we really have to carefully analyze that and not just um, give broad, you know, assumptions. Um, and then assessment on the nature of conflict and measuring peacefulness must be conducted before implementing as well as afterwards in order to measure the success of the project. So best practice would be to continuously measure peacefulness in the same location over a long period of time, even years after the project has ended. So we have to work on standard indicators to measure positive peace, which is really something that I know a lot of actors are working on. We have a lot of guidance already from uh, from USIP, we have the MPs, we have ACLID, we have Heidelberg Institute for International Conflict Research, we have a lot of people creating <laughs> indicators, but no one is, <laughs> very few people are actually using indicators to measure peacefulness when it comes to implementing humanitarian and development aid. And then just to conclude, <laughs> Um, and as was said before, more funding does need to be allocated um, to peace projects and conducting proper assessments, as well as supporting smaller national organizations in implementing these projects. Yes, thank you. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Thank you, Tordis. And yeah, uh, very relevant points. Policy is a must combining local action and policy and funding and support and working together with local communities. Uh, Jato, do you want to go next? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, sir. So, so the challenges we face here, considering the fact that I'm from an area where we rely so much on the forest, and most of what we get, like most of what we consume, comes from the forest. It is a little bit too difficult to convince people in my community to plant more of trees to protect our environment and knowing fully well that the ecosystem like the tree the plants are the main pillars of the ecosystem and it helps help fight against environmental degradation oh we have this problem of of convincing people in our community to plant and protect our environment like depositing plastics properly and keeping our water environment clean. But yet we have embarked on this mission of planting more trees to protect our environment, to even sensitize people in our community, no matter how hard it is to sensitize people in our community on the importance of protection of the environment. We also have the difficulties of sponsorship because I, and my group, we wish to travel in Cameroon, that's a country, of planting of trees. And I would have even loved something that I will be able to collaborate with more of the youth all over the world who are part of this protection of our environment to travel around the world to protect climate change, like to fight against climate change. Like I would like to travel around many different countries in the world to be able to sensitize people about the importance of our environment and fight against climate change. Thank you, sir. Amazing. Thank you, Jato. And yeah, finally, Niluni, do you have any reflections? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, mean, I just feel like all, all of us, um, those who spoke today, we have so many common points. It's incredible. So, um, I mean, back in 2015, the youth Peace and Security Resolution um, 2250 identified research as a key pillar of engagement, and the need remains the same. Where we need young researchers um, to you know to re, you know working in this nexus of climate, peace, and security to you know be trained with a lot more rigorous um, research tools to be able to match the demands to fully grasp the extent of what we are going to be fighting against throughout our lifetime. So. You know, from purely from a research and data point of view, if I may say, the challenge remains that researchers from developing countries um, who are in, you know, say for example, you know, in very, very vulnerable contexts um, don't have access to these cutting edge tools. And if we had good research, you know, we can 
better inform and better advocate for policy changes as well. And I think I speak on behalf of that entire community of young peace builders also that, um, you know, we are open to research collaboration and we are looking for and requesting um, intense training and mentorship so that, you know, we can learn to research in a way that we figure out effective strategies to build peace um, as we strive to keep our nation secure. So um, just as, um, you know, my fellow speakers spoke, uh, you know, mentioned earlier, um, you know, we, we need the flexibility um, to be able to now move into spaces that, you know, are opening up and gaps in the work we do. And sometimes um, funding tends to um, kind of close, you know, kind of narrow the doors that we want to walk through. So, you know, uh, that remains a challenge, but of course the opportunities are wide open as well. For example, this conference, we're very grateful for, um, you know, this platform for us to meet each other, network with each other and share our work as well. So, yeah, thank you very much. Amazing, thank you, Naroni. And indeed, uh, you know, having access to resources, networks and working together is, is very essential. Uh, Stay with us. We'll have a big surprise in the end where Jato will be sharing with us one of her very famous songs. Uh, but before that, let's open it up for uh, some questions and answers. I see uh, Thomas in the chat asking uh, about uh, advice for uh, young adults who are keen to help support climate change, activism and peace building, but don't know where to start. So uh, we've had some recommendations, but yeah, I would love to maybe share some reflections on that sense. Anyone wants to comment? I don't mind. Um, I think the first step, the first steps I would say that, that often happen hand in hand is both like um, engaging in both spaces, like, you know, reaching out to the climate space, reaching out to the peace building and disarmament space to even attend events like this to listen, to learn, to see what sparks your interest in terms of the issues, but also the reflection process of um, something that I found helps a lot of young people uh, just starting out and it helped myself was to, to recognize that we all have unique skills to contribute. Uh, and we've seen that spectrum here today, whether it be research, whether it be art, music, you know, you have unique skills that you can contribute to these movements. So thinking about what it is that you're, you know, skilled in and passionate about um, is incredibly useful in terms of, you know, finding a unique, unique way to come to the table um, to support these movements. It doesn't have to be, you know, protesting or policy. It can be really anything. Organizational skills are valuable. Um, being able to connect people is valuable. Being, you know, interested in research or science. Um, any, yeah, I think that that's part of the reflection process. Um, so just, you, ha you have something to contribute and um, every movement needs diversified skills. Definitely, I love that, yeah. Anyone can do something about it. And it's about, you know, knowing what you love and finding your passion. Any further reflections from any speakers? And yeah. Yeah, if I may, um, I think that's already a really great answer, um, Kesha, but um, I also wanted to add to that, like, don't be shy to share your opinion and don't be shy to approach policymakers or, um, you know, your, your village elders or whoever there is, because um, there was a focus group discussion that we conducted last month with a lot of really smart, really motivated young women. Um, and they were so enthusiastic to discuss climate change in their village um, and peace processes. And they had so much to say. And then when we asked them, okay, so now what are you going to do about it? What, like, who are you going to talk to? They were all silent. They didn't know what to do. So I think don't be shy to 
you know, talk to people to maybe go to start town hall meetings if they don't exist or approach the village elder, you know, um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, and, you know, if you're in the position where you can do internships with different organizations who work in this field, that's a good starting point as well um, to just see, you know, what are the peace building processes being done, who's working in climate change, there's a lot of possibilities, so don't be shy, is what I wanted to say. <laughs> Amazing, thanks for sharing, Tordes. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Uh, Rachel? Hello, I am Rachel Taza from Search for Common Ground. I've been um, supporting Saad and these wonderful speakers. So I'll take the privilege of uh, asking a question while we're waiting for others to come through. So I've heard a few hints of it, but I would love to hear more about the importance of safety for young people uh, advocating around climate and peace. We know, for example, from previous research that Search and our partners have done that young peace groups, uh, youth leaders working on peace face elevated risks whenever they step out and advocate for peace. And that's both from their own governments, it can also be from armed groups. Um, we also know that climate activists themselves are some of the most targeted uh, at risk in terms of their safety um, in many different countries. So I wonder if anyone had reflections on that um, and maybe uh, advice or requests on how to better support your safe uh, action. Yeah, very, very uh, relevant question. Neloni, do you want to reflect? Yeah, I'm just thinking, I mean, I think, like, so we also had, you know, threats from our former government, especially because they were against, you know, promoting reconciliation. But the strength was in numbers, to be honest. Um, the strength was that open community, you know, many people saying, um, no, this is, you know, we are not going to hide. But, um, and some, some, so somehow we, there was a sense of security that came from just the, the number of people who were willing to uh, step up and make themselves publicly known. If we went into hiding, then, you know, just the few people who did highlight themselves would have been more easily targeted. But, you know, I'm, I'm very aware that the contexts are very different, um, you know, where, from where I come from. So, um, you know, in Sri Lanka, because there's still a functioning you know, democracy and we haven't still gone into very violent government-led conflict against civilians, there's still a bit of space where civilian activism um, you know, cannot be controlled by the government as much as they like, but I know it's different in other places. So, yeah, um, you know, really depends on the context. But sometimes you gotta be safe. Um, but of course, you know, it's a it's a balance because if you if you are gone, <laughs> who's gonna do the work? <laughs> you know, and what is your what is safety as well? I mean, if there's a if there are threats to your life, um, you know, sometimes you're gonna have to. Um, you know, just for the sake of continuing your work, you know, try to see if you can use alternative ways, but um, if it's not a threat to your life as such, but, you know, um, yeah, very calculated, but also bold, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for uh, reflecting, Deloni. Any other speaker wanting to share some ideas? That if I may add one more thing to that, just as an example. So in the work, the organization that I work with, all of our phones are tapped by the government. Um, so we know for a fact that they hear every phone call and there is no running away from it. And there's nothing we can do. We, we, we can't keep changing our phone numbers every year either. It's just, a, you know, we're just going to have to go ahead, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, but those are risks that we have taken. And so far, so good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, also from my side, I guess it's really important for, you know, collaborations and unity, uh, being there and not being alone. And that's that's a nature thing, you know, with animals sticking together. So us being together as young organizations and having adult advocates also joining our cause is really important so that, you know, are connected and we have our own support system uh, being there to back us uh, and support us. Yes, I think, as you said, prioritizing our own safety is also very important 
uh, and having this balance can be tricky sometimes. Uh, also, uh, yeah, uh, before uh, giving the floor to Jato to also conclude with uh, her amazing song, maybe I'm sharing the chat, uh, the, a very interesting platform about uh, climate and peace security. So it's a platform made by Search for Common Ground and other stakeholders. Uh, and it's a space for you with over 200 resources and a forum where you can connect to over 260,000 users. And maybe Rachel, you wanna share more about the platform? Feel free to, yeah. Sure, yeah, no, this is um, something that we've worked on with a bunch of partners. And what we're looking at is a way for more practitioners to share knowledge, resources, what's working, what's not working. Um, we have here a page on climate change and conflict and our latest uh, series of discussions around this were really, what are some of the considerations that we have as peace builders that we want to make sure are represented in COP28, which is coming up the end of this year. So I encourage everyone here who's interested in this intersection to continue the discussion online afterwards. Definitely, thank you, Rachel. And uh, yeah, no better way to conclude than hear some of the work that's being done by our amazing speakers and uh, Jato, please to you the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Um, to speak a little bit about the song, the song is titled Like Your Fire and it's my first official song. The song is actually talking about protection of the environment, climate change, talking about peace, talking about togetherness, talking about culture. First of all, I am someone who loves promoting my culture. So you might basically have some problems with the song because just the chorus is in, in English and the rest of the song is in my dialect. This song says that whatever we the youths, because it speaks more to the youths, no matter the situation you find yourself in, Believe in yourself, light that fire of hard work in you. And I want to say to all of us present at this forum today that may we light that fire of hard work, togetherness in us and keep it burning at all times. May we never give up on our dreams. May we continue doing what we are doing. And it's very difficult to find very few, it's very, very rare to find people who protect their environment, their community, like, we the youth here, so I want all of us to light our fires and keep it burning. Everybody just light your fire. Keep the fire burning, just light your fire. Everybody just like your fire. Keep the fire burning just like your fire. That's what I have.
for Light Your Fire. Thank you very much. Please, you can go and download the song. It's on YouTube, Facebook, any social media platform, and you're going to find the song titled Light Your Fire. Thank you very much. My name is Jato Sunita. Light Your Fire by Jato Sunita. Thank Amazing. You. Amazing, Jato. That was really you know, so sensational. And I'm sure that the fire here in the, in the session today is lighting in all of us after this exciting discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure moderating this uh, session. And really, I guess now the momentum is there for the peace building climate and uh, the role, the huge role that you uh, young people have to play in this, in this space. So let's keep the conversation going. And let's see you in the future more doing more work and impacting and engaging with more other uh, stakeholders on the peace building and climate engagement. And uh, yeah, thank you to all the speakers for inspiring us today and for doing what they are doing. Thanks for uh, search for uh, organizing the session and for the participants who's been joining us today. Uh, with that, I have the pleasure to conclude the session and wishing you a beautiful rest of the day.